Good afternoon everyone and welcome to midweek. Can you believe it's September already? Um, I'm super excited because this man has already motivated me. Um, I recently joined the Elite Network and uh, Sid has been helping lots of companies that we're going to hear about um, through the Elite Network for recruiters. Um, and likewise, I've been part of that and I've been hugely motivated. So I know the impact that this man can make on your business and he is going to share um, all his insight on my favorite topic, sales. And I think this is so relevant right now because we've switched the recruitment market. We're all looking at sales. We're all looking at jobs and how do we get to them? So I think this is going to be hugely valuable for your recruiters and recruitment leaders. And um, so thank you for joining us. Now, Sid, just a wee bit of a background from you. We're lucky that you've got 23 years, if you're allowing me to say that, um, of recruitment experience. Um, and it's vast. I mean, you've been managing what managing director of a deco, you've been managing director of a coordinate group as well, where you've been leading acquisitions in terms of um, their strategy and acquisitions of other companies in there and recruitment companies as well. And you've also sold your first own recruitment business too. Um, the thing I really was very interested in is that you've come from quite a unique background and the sales side very heavily motivating on sales, but you've also come from the uh, philosophy side and L NLP as well. So that gives you a really sort of interesting balance, which I want to hear a little bit more about as well. And currently um, you are um, a mastermind consulting. So this is your own business just now helping, as we said, I think 18 odd fast growth startup recruitment companies. Um, along with uh, cheering and part of the Elite Networks. Welcome to the Farfish Crowdcast. Thank you for having me. Thank you. Excellent. Well, I'm really looking forward to it. I know we've got loads to cover, so I'm just going to get kickstart into it. Um, you, right now, sales and leaders and recruiters wanting to own their own, own desk, have got a real problem right now. How on earth do they start and think about their next one, two, three, four years of actually sort of planning out their growth right now. What What is the advice that you're sort of talking to recruiters just now on that sales side? Okay, so um, this is obviously something that I had to do and have done myself. You know, I started in recruitment in uh, 1997, building a desk from scratch. And most of the, the work that I do is around developing new desks, new markets, new geographies uh, from, from scratch. So something that I've done before, something that I continue to do now. And to me, it really begins with, you know, you can't be all things to all men. So having absolute clarity around your vertical market or your specialization is the absolute start point for success as far as, as far as I'm concerned. You know, the, this is more about, you know, mile deep, inch wide than it is about mile wide inch deep you know you can't skim across the surface anymore because as the you know as the economic environment continues i think that the real value will come from you having a niche and being all things to all men just doesn't does, doesn't work you know generalist recruitment is hard and it's going to be even harder right now so get in specific around your exact value and you know they, you know, it's, it's better to be you know well not jack of all trades master of none so having absolute clarity around your vertical market, you know, regardless of what that is, you know, my organizations that I work with, I'm quite sector agnostic. So my background was obviously IT recruitment and then engineering recruitment and then medical recruitment, nursing recruitment, marketing recruitment, data and analytics. So a lot of a lot of what I what I bring, as long as you can be specialist or vertical within a particular sector or discipline, that's the absolute start point. You know, that is the absolute tick box of how you become successful in, in recruitment at desk, at desk level. And it's quite, it's a really valid point because we've all heard, you know, you've got to be a niche before, but I think there's a temptation right now to try and work on anything you can get. So I think sort of straight, staying true to that, that, that niche is great. How do you, you've got that specialization, so how do you take that and actually start new sales in a market like this? So one thing that, another thing that I'm deeply, deeply passionate about and make and make an absolute focus, you know, once you've got your, your vertical market or your specialization, this is then about identifying, you know, and I always say 100 businesses, you know, 100 businesses 
that you want to have on your target list that you will be penetrating. And I'm not talking about one phone call, then you, then you, then you give up. You know, my whole philosophy, you know, or theory or attitude about not just recruitment, but about sales in general is it's a very, very simple thing to do, but so often people overcomplicate it. Mm-hmm. What, is, what is sales? You know, sales is, for sales to be successful, we have to, what we spoke about earlier, be very clear around the value or the proposition that we bring. What's our niche? What's our, what's our market? Once we're clear on that, yeah, it's then about how many, who are we selling to? How many people are we selling to? How often are we selling to those people? And what are we saying? In essence, that is what recruitment is. Not just recruitment. That is what sales is. You know, it's, it's about knowing what you're selling, selling to the right people, selling to enough of them on a repeated or structured process because, as we already know, you know, 2% of sales are made on the first call, 3% on the second, 5% on the third. It's until we get to that fifth and sixth core contact where we actually start seeing, start seeing success. But most recruiters have given up by that point. So yeah. the whole, we used to call it, you know, Cinderella call, you phoning up and then saying, brilliant, I've been waiting for you to call me, just doesn't happen. You know, this is about building relationships. Another word that I'd like to discuss further with, you know, with, with yourself and, and, and the audience. I hear that so often, relationship. And, it, and when I look at data, it's not relationship, it's pure transaction. So the start point really is when you do your market mapping and you're understanding your marketplace, you know, and where do we get all our information from? Yeah, the gold mine, candidates. You know, we talk to candidates. You know. My view is always in recruitment or part of my philosophy was always, I don't, I don't just fill jobs, you know, I place candidates. And for me, I used to take my product to market rather than, you know, try and pull jobs, fill jobs. To me, when you first start working with a client, a lot of the time that is, you know, by proactively introducing them to a resource that can add significant value to their business. And that comes with experience in terms of mapping your market, knowing what projects are going on, having repeat conversations. So to me, after a period of time, you're able to establish a target list, you know, a wish list, a list of, and I'm not talking about, you know, picking the 100 biggest companies in the the country or the world and saying I'm working with them because they will all come with their own individual challenges. But to have a list of 100 companies that's made up of, you know, SMEs, you know, where it's not, potent, where they don't potentially have PSLs or procurement, your mid-range, you know, where you can have more direct relationships with them, and also your large companies that can provide you potentially with volume. I think picking your hundred over time, yeah, and then slowly but surely building a continuous relationship with them on a monthly basis is the only way forward because you know your vertical, you know who you're speaking to and if they're relevant, how many of these contact points you have. You can't have three people to sell to in a month. By the same token, you can't say that you've got 2,000 managers that you're in contact with and selling to because that won't work either. So to me, I genuinely believe that my theory or my philosophy has always been 100 companies, 200 contacts. And that's two per client. That's just general rule of thumb. You don't have to agree with it or disagree with it because nothing's right and nothing's wrong. But generally, to be able to, that is normally the right amount of volume. 100 clients, two contacts per client, 200 contact points that you are contacting, selling to, building a relationship with, nurturing, um, progressing with on a monthly basis. And then, of course, it's about what are you saying to these people? You know, what's your service proposition? So, you know, relationships and service propositions, two things that, you know, we can explore further here because I work with some of the most successful businesses in, in Europe. And still, when I, when I start working with them and I ask them to walk me through their service proposition, they either don't have one or they can't articulate it properly, which I find astonishing given how well they've done. So... I've, my, my belief or philosophy 
it was real simple and it has been since i guess i first started managing in in recruitment in 1998 uh, s3 and it's success really goes to those that do most of the basics most often to the best of their ability that really is it and i see so much stuff out there from experts you know everyone's an expert that really seem to complicate what i just believe to be a really simple but beautiful process if executed properly do you know there's so much i could take from that because i've heard you on the groups as well and you know you, you have you have guests coming on to the groups within elite too and um you ask them hey this is your opportunity you know what do you do and how could you benefit the group and you're always there for that articulated group. just tell me what the benefits are just tell me what the benefits are and i think that's yeah. one of the things that definitely in terms of the recruitment world you know we're all matching people but it's how we do that how we package that up what's the depth of that relationship so in terms of the steps, because you have a lot of people in the audience out there listening to that and saying, do you know what? That's really good. 100 customers, two customer, you know, two clients identified per customers. I could have a mix of customers as well. Some of the small, some, you know, different types of customers. So if I get a product, a candidate, I could see where I want to target them. How do you actually get back down to the real basics of starting that relationship with that customer from scratch? Okay, so... You know, for th th this is where I talk about service proposition, mm -hmm. you know, or or OBS, you know, opening benefit statement. You know, it, it's for a, co a company has a service proposition. Yeah. But if if I was if you and I were doing the same, we're in the same uh, business next to each other, for example, Wendy, the hundred companies that I pick could be very different to the hundred companies you pick. Why? Because this ultimately comes down to your personality. Yeah. yeah? You as a person. <laughs> How do you get on? You know, how do you get on with this person? And that's what makes our industry so great. It's the fact that each one of us is unique. You know, mm -hmm. one of us might get on great with one particular customer because they happen to like that, that approach. One of us might not get on great with that customer because they don't like that kind of approach. But, but for me, what are you turning up with on that first call? You know, I love, I love uh, these debates on LinkedIn where it says uh, cold calling uh, shouldn't happen anymore. Cold calling is dead. And I think to myself, if you're still making cold calls, something's really wrong. Yeah. Because I've never even seen it as a big cold call when I used to do it myself because I wasn't just turning up blind. You know, I, I did my research. Yeah. So I'd either speak to candidates that have worked there. I'd read the press. I'd read the company's press articles and websites. I would track them on LinkedIn, see where people had worked from. You know, so, so for me, for me, I'd, I'd always do my homework. You know, what are you saying? What What are you turning up with on that first call that is going to be interesting? Mm -hmm. You know, and what have you got to lot, offer? <laughs> yeah, but, but it's not. It's not just. It's. It's what are you offering? Yeah, mm -hmm. and how are you offering it? What are you saying? Mm -hmm. Because a lot of the time, you know, people are letting themselves down because they're not. They haven't done the homework. They haven't done. They haven't done the planning, or they're not believing in the product. That they are that they are selling. So a lot of the work, you know, my background is 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 psychology. Um, yes, I use a lot of a lot of NLP, but to me, a lot of what we do is about is about confidence, and it's about confidence in your own. It's about confidence in your own product. Do you believe in the company you work for? Mm -hmm. Do you believe in the value that you bring, you know, to that customer? Because I've seen many cultures where people they're delighted if a client will speak to them on the phone. Whereas I think to myself, if you're turning up with value, yeah, you know, to me, the most important part of any organization is people. And we as an industry provide people. So as far as I'm concerned, we should be the most important supplier to our, to our customers. You know, and I always used to frame this when I, when I was selling a business um, and uh, private equity would ask me, why, tell me what you do. And I thought about it and the way I see it, and it was, it was tech. Tech is the difference between survival and competitive edge. Oh, I love so you that. have to, but you have to have the right tech to survive. That's your minimum requirement, survive, or you can use tech to get competitive advantage. And when I put it like that, they get it, they get it, you know, and this is how you are helping companies survive 
where you are helping companies get competitive edge. But when I work with a client, I ask them to help me understand their service proposition. Because once I get it, then I, can, then, I, then I get it. I know what we're working with. But if I don't get it, then I don't understand why a colleague, a candidate, or a, or, or a client would get it. But talking to candidates in your field of specialization is, 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 is the way forward. And I'm, you know, I'm a, in my opinion, candidates are, are just as, if not more valuable than clients because from our relationships with our candidates, yeah, we're able to proactively take our candidates to market, build lifelong relationships. You know, I'm talking about, people talk about repeat business with customers. Why aren't we talking about repeat business with candidates? Mm -hmm. you know, especially on contracts, every time they finish their contract, are we there to be able to move them from one to the other to the other? On permanent, you know, the average tenure in a perm role is two and a half years. So why aren't we placing these people every two and a half, three years or helping them with their career? So to me, everything begins with the candidates. And again, where we have 100 clients, 200 candidates, I've always preached that there should be 200 to 250 candidates, passive candidates that you would like to work with at some point in your, in your future, that you can speak to once a month, you know, to build relationships with so that when it's time them to want to move yeah that you can help them to do to do just that so start point is absolutely talk to candidates you know understand you know where do companies work where do where do, where do candidates work in companies that you want to know about yeah and i just i see people miss miss the trick a lot and i ask you know good you know small companies what do you want to be do you want to place candidates or do you want to fill jobs and that's always a bit of an eye-opener for them. But I ask the same thing to large organizations. What do you do? Explain to me, what is the culture? Do you just do you fill jobs or do you place candidates? Because to me, you should be doing both in equal measure. Mm -hmm. You know, when I hear people say, oh, I didn't call him back because I didn't have a job for him. And I think to myself, why can't you take them to market and create a job for them? Mm -hmm. And to me, that, that's value. That, that's ultimate value. But that's specialization and really being able to give your candidates and your clients a quality a quality service and you know the other thing that i'm <coughs> excuse me very much an advocate of as well is that what i find in a lot of recruitment companies would be interesting if you've seen this too is that exact um example that you gave you know a candidate comes in and says, oh, i didn't didn't have anything for them but your team members may as well and and i think you know, I've done a lot of stats around what makes a successful agency. And if you can get that one candidate actually offered like to five companies you're going to cover with them, they're probably not going to think about going elsewhere because they've got, they're then going to choose three of them to go to interview with. So if your agency can cover that instead of per recruiter that maybe has one of their target clients just taking that person to market on one client then they're going to go elsewhere they're going to go out with your organization and I think that's really teamwork for for, for agencies just now is, is really vital as well yeah you know you, you you have organizations where you know no one owns candidates there's no candidate ownership you know and if they're you know remember there are teams in companies where you'll have six seven ten maybe the whole company doing the same vertical yeah so when a candidate comes in yes Either you can place them or one of your colleagues can place them. Absolute, absolutely so. You know, but we often, a lot of the stats that, that, that I look at, you know, are around, you know, jobs with multiple interviews. You know, how, how many or candidates with multiple interviews. If, some, if I sent my CV to someone and they got me one interview, I'd probably look, go to another agency and try exactly. and get another, another interview. But I think it just goes to show that, I think it just goes to show that when, you know, a lot of the time we are just being reactive. In my opinion, if you're a specialist and you have a, you have, you know, an, a, an, a, you get a good candidate register with you. Yes, you will have live vacancies, but I'm, I'm assuming that you can probably talk to clients that you've got good relationships with to let them know that quality resources on the market again. You know, a lot of end clients that I talk to want to know exactly that you know they want to know exactly that who is on the market again especially on contract that's worked here before that is a known quantity you know and when you look at contractor cvs like i always always did you'll often find 
that their last six jobs have been at three or four companies mm -hmm. because the project will have come to a natural end. They'll go and work somewhere else, but then they but then they go back into that business. You know, our job. This is when I talk to clients about how big is your database. You know, someone told me the other day eight hundred thousand candidates. I was like, brilliant. How many managers? How many managers? Three hundred and twenty thousand. Excellent. How many have you spoken to in the last three months, percentage wise? You know, about six, seven percent. And I think to myself, why? Right. Why are they there? You know, yeah. either talk to someone or don't talk to someone. And and to me, this is about building relationships with less people mm -hmm. rather than not having relationships with thousands of people. You know, it's funny. I think the old days, and you know, we were all there. You know, I remember how many websites we have got ninety thousand candidates. <laughs> we were with 20,000 and it was all ego. It was who had the biggest database. Whereas I've seen a real, in fact, I push a lot of my clients mm -hmm. towards less, but more, you know, mm -hmm. in the age of data, you know, this used to be about big data, mm -hmm. but it's about big data now. This is about clean data. And I just think less clients, better service, more in-depth service, rather than just flirting or skirting across you know, I still, I work with clients now that said no to me two years ago, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. but no is okay because it's just not the it's right just time. Not re exactly. Just yeah. not right now. <laughs> yeah, that's fine. And that's absolutely fine because I can't work with everyone at the same time anyway. Mm -hmm. And and the point is you're building a relationship and you're just, you're trying to get in, you're trying to remain in, in mind so that when they do have that next vacancy or opportunity that they come to you. But you have to earn that. You know, you have to earn that. You can't just talk to customers when they're recruiting. You know, what are you adding? What value are you adding around, around that? Now, how well do you know them? Do you pitch this as, we just fill your vacancies? Or do you pitch this as, you know, we provide you insight, benchmarking? What else, what else do you do that makes you, that makes you stand out? And a lot of that will be your technology and your tools and your resources. But the key part of that, is you is your personality you as a person and that, as i say that's what i love there are you know i've seen it many times when someone new into an organization will all of a sudden start working with a business that they haven't been able to get in with for years mm -hmm. and it's just a different face a different time a different approach and that's what i love about this that, it is that everyone we all recruiters come in all shapes and sizes they you do. know all shapes I'm and sizes and so do you make this really, you make it sound really easy. And what you, I love is the fact you've just identified the basics, you know, 100 clients, 100 candidates, let's work them if they're talented and you've got good customers. And then we can, at some point, make that connection. Um, but how do you get into that? You know, you've got a very confident, you've been there, done that, you know it works. But there's a lot of people probably out in the industry right now are in a, perhaps just come into the industry in the last couple of years, so they're in a different mindset. How do you, how do we help these recruiters to actually get into that mindset of, you know, confidently be able to go to market like that? I think that you know a lot of a lot of work I do with with organisations is about this um, is about this uh, engagement contract, right? Contracts of engagement with each other. So the company has a responsibility as an employer. You have a responsibility to set a defined you know mission vision values purpose right you need to define a clear career path probation pass criteria career ladder commission and incentives monthly business reviews ongoing development uh, sales collateral for the team you know as much development as possible only when an organization provides that can it expect results from its employees that that that's my that's my view mm -hmm. so you don't want people to be coming in to set up to fail you know this is a partnership where as a business we provide all of the tools the support the training the structure yeah and in return yeah we ask for what you know discipline repetition yeah confidence and you know what i'll say this because this is a very interesting uh, point you you um, you raise and it's called, you know, how much time should a recruiter spend in the valley of disappointment? Okay. So when you join recruitment, it's hard. It's really hard. And it should be. 
it mm. should be. You know, I've seen people join recruitment companies where on the first day they're told, look, help us out, resource on this role. And I think I just think that's wrong. I just think to myself, you you need to feel, yeah, the hard work, the pain for at least three months. Because after three months, once you've stuck to the process and you start seeing green shoots, you've earned it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. If there's no pain, there's no resilience. And, and as we've seen from the last six months, the resilient have survived. And yeah. you have to be resilient in this job on a daily basis before COVID. You know? So I think being resilient, sticking to the basics, knowing that it will come. Yeah, because it will come. I, you know, it's guaranteed it will come. If you're, there are certain things that if you're on the right vertical and you've got to be put on the right vertical, the right, you know, territory, the right geography, you can't, for example, do Java global. Yeah, that won't work, right? <laughs> that, that won't really work. So when I talk about, you know, the niche, the better, as far mm-hmm. as I'm concerned. And I'm talking about niche into a specific geography, for example, even, even better, because you're then having to learn and map a market and, and you you own that you own that market so sometimes too much freedom can actually be a really bad thing you know people don't get this but psychologically too much freedom you don't know where to start if you want to eat an elephant you've got to take one small bite initially right so from a confidence perspective you know you 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 need to be in an environment and a culture that encourages you to make as many mistakes as possible yeah, mm-hmm. if you're scared of making mistakes, you're you're not in the right environment. You know, I made loads of mistakes. I still make mistakes. You know, making mistakes is okay. Yeah, you have to because you learn from making mistakes. If you're in your comfort zone the whole time and you're not pushing yourself, then I don't think that's really learning. So have your have your plan. You know, work your plan. Plan your work. It was it was always what we used to say. But confidence comes in time, and it comes from 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 results. But don't expect perfection because it doesn't exist. You know, I always look at precision. Our job is precision. And at desk level, you know, even when I did it, it was just about refining your approach, you know, your content, your skill, your delivery. It was about constantly refining it so that it became more precise, not perfect. Perfect doesn't exist. So it's time, isn't it? It's Wendy. It's, it's, mm-hmm. it's focus, experience, and in time, yeah, you start building that building that momentum. Our job, though, as, as as owners, managers, leaders, is to make sure that people are pointed in the right direction. They are supported. Yeah, they are supported. They know that it's okay to make mistakes, and they have realistic timeframes. You know, in which to be able to achieve certain criteria to pass pass probation. But year one is hard. It's going to be hard, and if it's not hard. It should be hard. Mm-hmm. So that's my that's my view. No, and 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 gosh, I remember I could take you back. Um, anybody that worked at me for my first recruitment job, I remember telling my father. I uh, just about up to that 12, 12 week mark, I was out. Uh, at this recruitment game was 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 not for me. Mm-hmm. And then I I, I filled my first uh, project manager six hundred pounds a day for a six month contract, and I thought, okay. I'll stay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah. it's a very, very good critical three months there. Yes. Um, so I think I've got a couple of questions here that um, I want to touch on. Now, one of them, we're very much looking at sales, and, um, I know just now, but it's one that's come up and I'd be really interested because, you know, you've got sales and marketing going on. Um, this one's from Teresa, though. She's a small startup and she's wanting to think about how would you get marketing tools to sort of dovetail into what you've been talking about from a sales perspective there what would your what would your methods be that you would recommend to her so when you're again you know when you're this is about two things okay it's about it's about your message and your audience yeah so i think i always see it as see it see it as that and to me absolute clarity on the message you know please take this the right way uh listeners there's so much noise out there you know people Mm -hmm. making noise for the the sake of making noise and my view is if you've got nothing to say don't feel that you have to say something and to me it's 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 more it's more about what do you want to say that is unique to you 
-hmm. Yeah. Just get it's almost like it backs you up. Yeah. What do you want to say? Who do you want to say it to? So mm -hmm. super so, so to me, service proposition or personal value proposition, yeah. And my 100 clients, 200 managers, that's all the marketing I want to do. Yeah. However, I also want to be targeting the right candidate space as well. So my marketing, I don't like, you know, mass marketing that is pretty irrelevant to probably 99% of the people. So my view, my view would always be that you know, most of the stuff I do, Wendy, is one-to-one. -one. Yeah. You know, I, I don't really, I don't really market, you know, I, I, I like one-on-one -on -one because I can really tailor my approach having done my research so I can get the message right rather than, you know, we're not about you come home and you've got, you know, the whole house has received, you know, the whole roads received a leaflet for double glazing. Yeah. And they're just hoping that one person says, yes, we want double glazing. That would be great. You know, that's not, that's not what we are. So to me, first and foremost, you know, before you do the marketing, make sure that your CRM, you know, I can't stress the importance of every time you put a candidate or a client on the CRM, justify why they're going on. That's a great tip. You know, are we going to speak to this candidate every month? Mm -hmm. If not, don't put them on. Mm -hmm. Why are we trying to work with this customer? Just explain it to me. Mm -hmm. Because our responsibility as owners or, or managers or consultants is we're allowing people to call people on a database. Yeah. So we should be responsible for the quality of those people because if there's no chance that any is going to come from these from these contacts, then don't don't call them. Mm -hmm. Don't call them, you know, but Quite often I work with companies that just say, yeah, we just spent a whole year throwing as many candidates and clients onto the database as possible. And I just think, no, that's not what you need, is it? That's not what you need. You know, you need, you know, just pick, pick your clients cleverly, right? And then just try and build, 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 build relationships over right. time. Not, not, you know, patience, right, is a great thing. Mm -hmm. And the, a lot of people don't have patience. We live in a world where instant gratification is required and it doesn't work like that. You know, sometimes the client you add to the system today or speak to the system today, yeah, you won't work with for perhaps 12 months, 18 months, but that doesn't matter because yeah. if you didn't do that work today, you wouldn't get it. You'll remember the work that you've done. Yeah. Correct. Correct. So, Correct. Teresa, I hope that, that helps a little bit there. I've got one other last question very quickly too because I know that there's been lots of chit-chat here as well, which is great. Um, so this is for Carmen. Um, would you consider a region being a niche market or would you say it needs to be an industry niche within an area? So just to give you some wee bit of context there, they are a small city um, with only generic um, generalist recruitment agencies and a lot of independent consultants. They are a niche to a certain degree internationally, but not, um, not, not as an agency. So I'm not quite sure of that last part, but I think really it's it's how far do you push it? Um, and, and we've just got a couple of minutes on that because I think you've covered quite a lot of yeah, it. Yeah. But if there's any sort of thoughts on that, Sid, that would be really helpful. So so to me, you know, general staffing, yeah, is often. So obviously at ADECO, we had, you know, general staffing brands and you'd have branches and they, they literally, their job was to dominate that area. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So yes, it does work. You know, so general staffing, regional can work. Yeah. Good. But I've also seen, you know, example, 1997, I did Lotus Notes, London and the Southeast only contract, right? So I do still see it. You know, for example, some of my clients are, you know, Java, Berlin, mm -hmm. yeah, .NET, Paris. So yes, it, it does because, you know, definitely, definitely works. But my view is as you grow as a business and you get more and more staff, in a way, you do have to almost, you know, bring people's regions back in. But I remember saying to my, you know, to my manager, wow, look how well I've done in my first six months. Imagine you'd have given me the whole country. And he said, <laughs> and he, he said no, look how badly you would have done if I gave you the whole country. Good, and and good that's, we're just, what are we doing? You know, we're just, we're pointing people in the right direction. So they're just focusing in and, and you know, being more targeted. Because as I say, too much freedom 
it doesn't work. Yeah. You know, what do you, what do you do with it? You know, guess what? what you can do the whole of IT and the whole of the UK. Where do you start? Where do you start? Mm-hmm. You know, it just doesn't knowing a niche and knowing a knowing a region, I think is I think is the way forward because it means that your candidates are equally suitable for other clients. And it means that you know other clients are going to be looking for similar skills. So yeah, to me, specialization or, or sorry, verticalization and regionalization is is definitely the way forward. You don't okay. have to be all things to all men. If you want to be all things to all men, they might as well go and use a deco, Hayes, Ranchdad, Manpower. You know, what do you do? What do you do? That's Which, your niche. And that comes back to where we began in terms of making sure that you understand why would people want to work with you and create that value. Yep around exactly. your product and your sales not you know your sales marketplace which i think is Absolutely. just if people are taking something from today that's exactly what i would be taking said so um yeah. thank you so much for sharing so much i could be talking to you for lots and lots and lots of times and i'm sure we're going to get you back on um the, the show if you, if you join us um, in the future as well because there's loads of topics that we could have gone off there so thank yeah. you for sharing and i know that uh, the audience has been really engaged so i, I think there's been lots of we gems with that as well I'm just going to finish. Thank you, Jackie Mills. (laughs) I'm just going to finish up, right? And it's going to be a really short answer then. From now to Christmas, what's your little bit, one bit of advice to recruiters right now? Clean your data, nail your service proposition, have faith, and crack on and have a great year of 2021. And celebrate at Christmas. Awesome. I love that. Well, listen, thank you so much, everybody, for sharing right. and um, and being part of that show, Sid. I hope everybody has got more from that. Again, do all your stuff. If you like what you hear, share it, like it. Um, come and join us every fortnight when we uh, get a new brilliant guest in. Obviously, not as brilliant as you, Sid. <laughs> um, there's a bit of competition for how many people are on each show starting to happen <laughs> up, so that's good. Um, but we'd be delighted to know any topics you want us to share, any Anything you want to get us involved in you know we're here to serve you um, and hopefully create some some value uh, for you to be better recruiters and change the way you recruit so thank you for tuning in um, and i will see you in a fortnight thanks Brilliant. all